Okay. <clears throat> Hello, guys. Welcome back. Um, hope you guys are doing really well and that some of you are uh, going to be able to benefit from this little review session that we're going to hold. This is the last one just to kind of get you guys prepped and ready to go for the final later today. <clears throat> About five minutes left until it's class time. But um, hope you're doing well and that you've had a pretty good semester. Um, it's always a little... Uh, it's a nice feeling to be able to head into the break. It's also sometimes a little uh, sad to see a class end, um, but at the end of the day, we're on to better things, I believe, next year, 2021. So thanks for um, doing your best to get through this really tough year. And I do understand that it's been a challenge for uh, a lot of us, but here we are and not to worry. Four minutes. <clears throat> hey there, Troop. Good to see you. Hope you're doing good. Oh, <laughs> well, better late than never, huh? I'm glad that you're here. This has been the format, you know. Um, it's it's pretty good, I think. It's interactive, but there's not all the distraction of a, a bunch of cameras and mics. Um, sometimes I switch it up and utilize Zoom as well, but um, so far I've just had a little bit better time with the YouTube, and I think it's nice that the lectures remain up permanently and that they're all archived. Um, but, yeah, it's pretty chill. I don't... I don't have any problem with it at all, since I already sort of knew how to use YouTube and comfortable with the platform. It was, I thought, easiest for me to just migrate over to this. Um, but eventually, I guess we'll all be back in the classroom. Maybe, uh, maybe next fall. We'll see. <clears throat> I think with the vaccination campaign coming out next year. Uh, they'll be able to probably have people receive vaccination certification and uh, those people will be allowed into all kinds of like public places where they can gather. Um, so it'll take some time, but it'll be all right. But thanks again here for being here, Truck. And then anybody else, feel free to say hi in the chat or, um, or whatever you like. But um, I know it won't be a, a ton of people here probably at the, at the meeting this morning just because um, it's a different time slot than the typical one. Um, and it is the last day, so probably some people are just focusing on their own private review and study. But uh, I'm here to help if I can. Hey, hey, Tyler, good to see you too. In just about another minute, it'll be 10. And then I'll uh, walk you guys through some of our um, review guide. And you'll help me with that. Hi there, Eduardo. Good to see you too. Good morning. <clears throat> glass of water here. Okay, well, it's more or less uh, 10 a.m. now, so welcome back, guys. Um, 
glad that you guys are here to get a little bit more review in before we take our test today. So um, <clears throat> anybody here that was at our review session on Tuesday by chance? Just a question because um, maybe that type of person could tell me uh, where we left off. But if I actually do have, I think, a good memory of it. I believe we were dealing with the first midterm review session uh, study guide on Tuesday. <clears throat> and so today, I guess we should probably focus mostly on the, uh, the, the other study guide, the more recent one that leads up to your guys' final. So um, let's do that. I'm looking at that study guide right now. I have it pulled up on my um, browser, or sorry, on my um, word processor here in a different window. So I'm looking at it, and I'll just walk you guys through all the different topics there. Or Really, I want you guys to help. So I want you guys to try your best to supply the information, and then um, I'll correct and clarify and, and add detail if needed. Um, <clears throat> so that's the plan. And you already have this study guide, or at least you should, because I, I sent it last weekend. So um, for you to follow along through the study guide, just go ahead and um, pull yours up if you have the file, and um, we'll, we'll talk about all the topics, or as many as we have time for between now and 11.15. Um, <clears throat> I have my office hours today from 2.30 to 3.30, like always on Thursday. So anybody who had any last-minute questions or anything else, I guess, could also stop by that. I'm going to... I'm going to send the, um, the Zoom link for the office hour after this is over with. So um, that's another option for some. And then the test itself, I'm going to mail it around 4 o'clock, and you'll have until 5.30 to uh, fill in your answers, give me the test form back with your completed responses. So uh, that's the plan for today. And uh, after that, you know, happy holidays, and I hope you guys have a good break, and uh, happy new year. But okay, let's get started with this. So first of all, what's a fallacy? Does anybody have a sense what is a fallacy? This, this is a major concept. So we're starting with chapter um, the, the review notes for chapter five, which is the chapter of the book that's all about fallacies. And so my first question is that, what is a fallacy? It's, these are the questions listed on the study guide, so I'm just going in that order. Someone can tell me, maybe, what is it? Yeah, what do you think? Fallacy. Okay, good, Eduardo. When an argument has a logical error, uh, yes, when an argument has a logical error or flaw, and that makes the premises not give the right type of support to the conclusion. Correct. So fallacy is like a bad, defective argument. A fallacy is whenever an argument has one of these flaws or errors. And um, over the centuries, people have been able to identify and name uh, different kinds of fallacies and different individual fallacies. So um, there are, yes, when an argument has a logical error or a flaw. And because of the flaw or the error, the premises don't really give the right support to the conclusion. Okay, now, what is a fallacy of ambiguity? That's, there's three categories of fallacies that we all learned. There are fallacy of ambiguity, fallacy of relevance, and fallacy of unwarranted assumption. So first of all, the fallacy of ambiguity, that is the type of fallacy when the uh, argument has um, ambiguous words, sloppy grammar, or a confusion between two similar concepts. So that would be the definition for that one. The problem with those type of fallacies is the ambiguity uh, element. Some of the words are vague or ambiguously defined, or grammar is sloppy, etc. cetera. Um, okay, so then equivocation. Let's ask about that. This is one of the uh, fallacies of ambiguity. What is equivocation fallacy? So let's see if you could tell me this one. We're just going to run through all the fallacies one time. So starting with equivocation, what is that one? <clears throat> okay, good, Tyler. So when a key term in an argument is used more than once and with different meanings. Okay, correct. So like when you have an argument and there's a term or a key phrase within it and the word appears more than once, but the meaning of it switches up and in one of the different uses of the term, and therefore the argument is, uh, is invalid. If I say to you that um, um, my uncle, uh, he, he lives to the right, or sorry, my, of my uh, cousin, and when you're to the right of somebody, that means you're more conservative than them. So my uncle's more conservative than my cousin. 
that could be equivocation, right? Because I'm using the word right in two different senses. One in the political sense, you know, right wing, left wing. In the other premise, I'm talking about literally that he's just, he has a house to the right of the other person, like in a sense of direction. Um, another case, John is at the bank and the bank is where you can deposit money. So John is at a place where you can deposit money. But we might be using the word bank in different ways. Like he's at the river bank is what we meant in premise one. And the second premise, we're talking about a financial bank. But if we're using the word bank twice with different meanings, then even though it looks like the same word, the conclusion doesn't follow. So that's equivocation. You just got to be careful to use words in a solid, um, consistent sense throughout an argument. Or if somebody else is giving you an argument where they're trying to change the meaning of words halfway through, then you got to call them on that and say, that's equivocation. Okay, so next it's amphiboly. Amphiboly is the um, grammatical error or grammatical ambiguity fallacy. So it's when um, there's a grammatical error or ambiguity in the argument, and that makes it so that there's more than one conclusion that you could draw, and you don't know which one to draw. So, like, for example, what if somebody said, um, Trump and Biden just had their election, and I'm so glad that he won. Um, do you understand how that statement is kind of an amphiboly? Because we just referred to the two um, male uh, candidates, and... We just use the simple singular plural pronoun he and saying I'm glad he won, but he is ambiguous here grammatically and we don't know which um, subject that the pronoun, the pronoun attaches to. Okay, so in the quiz I believe I gave you another kind of funny example, which was uh, the boys went out skiing and they got some ice cream cones, but they were too cold to enjoy. Um, you know, in that case, the word they is the grammatically ambiguous term because we have two uh, boys, I guess, that are described, and the plural pronoun they could refer to them. They are too cold to enjoy their ice cream cones. But it also says they got some ice cream cones, plural, and they may be the referent toward the ice cream cones themselves, like they're so frozen hard, cold, that they can't be enjoyed by the boys. So examples, examples on examples. So we move ahead, just jump into the next one. The fallacy of accent. Um, anybody have an idea about that? What is the fallacy of accent? <clears throat> what do you think about that one? Hmm? Let's see. Just let me hear that one from you, if you can tell me. Accent. Eduardo, okay, so a word or phrase that is emphasized can change the meaning of the statement, right? So it's when a, the meaning of the statement or argument changes based on which word or phrase within it is emphasized or accented. Um, like we have this case in the book where we imagine that the parent is scolding the child for doing something with fire, like burning something down. The parent says to the child, what are you doing? With, uh, that's terrible. I told you, don't ever play with matches. Look what happened. Child says, correct, I know. You said don't play with matches. Technically, I wasn't playing with them. I was just trying to see how fire works, and I was curious about it scientifically. But, you know, that's um, obviously not what was intended by the parent who says don't play with matches. They mean just don't do anything with matches. So by accenting the word, it's like you're trying to give a narrower interpretation of it than what the parent actually meant. Or I could imagine a case where, like, uh, I think I said something like, your mom or dad comes home, sees you spending time with a friend they don't want in the house, and they told you before, don't ever let this person come through the door again. And you're like, well, I know that, but you know, you said don't let them come through the door. I let them in through the garage, and so they technically didn't come through the door. Obviously, the statement originally was just a shorthand way of saying don't let them in the house at all, not just don't let them specifically through the one entrance, which we call a door. Okay, <clears throat> so next is fallacy of division. Um... What do you think is the division fallacy, if you were going to say, if I asked you that question, what would be your answer there? <clears throat> division? It's like this kind of part whole thing going on with these division and composition fallacies. But let's see what you can tell me. <clears throat> okay. 
division? What do you think? I know there's only a couple of us here, so it's like you have a little bit more of the heavy lifting to do, but it's really, it's to your benefit either way. I mean, but sorry that there's not like, you know, 40 people here that could kind of take a little bit of the heat off you from the answers. Um, so I'm, I'm willing to help and so, sort of supply a lot of information, but you can just kind of help me sometimes. So, um, Ken, you're saying, when a person incorrectly infers that each member of a group has to have a characteristic that the whole group has. Yes, correct. So like if I say, um, um, so the United States is the most wealthy nation of, in the world, and I am one member of the United States, one citizen. So therefore, I'm the wealthiest person in the world. But that's certainly not necessarily true, obviously. You can have a, a big country that has a lot of wealth, but it doesn't necessarily mean that every single part of the country is wealthy. Um, I don't know. We could say that, um, say, for example, someone's in a family, and their family is just overall like a very loud family. So if you had a family reunion or gathering, it'd be like a bunch of, you know, boisterous, outgoing, um, you know, loud chat and talk. But uh, that doesn't mean that one person that's a member of the family is also loud. So like the Vulich family is loud. I'm one of them. Therefore, I'm loud. That doesn't necessarily follow. But sometimes the whole, whole collection has a feature that you don't see in each part. Like um, the cells in my body, um, when you combine them together, um, <clears throat> you, you have an object here, me, that can speak. So I can speak, but that doesn't mean that each cell in my body can speak. Okay. Uh, yeah, Bianca, that, that's another example given in the book, um, and I did mention it when we lectured on it before. So Canadians are nice, um, but it doesn't mean that each individual Canadian is a nice person. Um, so anyways, there you go, division. So then let's talk about the other one, which is composition. Composition is like just the reverse. So I can tell you that it's when um, you incorrectly assume or infer that because one member of a group or collection has a feature that the whole group has to have it as well. And that's just not necessarily true. Um, going off the example of um, my body, right? One cell is not visible to the naked eye. So therefore my body is not visible to the naked eye. Incorrect. Um, yeah, one cell you, only, you can only really see with a microscope, but when you take all the cells gathered together that form me, they, they collect to something that is obviously a, a larger whole and that has the ability to be seen without any kind of magnification. Um, Dr. Vulich is a doctor, so his family are all doctors. That's not true. Certainly in my case, I'm the only one that has got a PhD in my whole family, but um, you look at my educational attainment as a member of my family, but that does not necessarily imply that the whole family has that. Um, so yeah, these are all composition fallacies. Uh, here's another one, okay. Um, well, actually this is more, let me go back to division for a second because I wanted to give you this example, which I thought was pretty good. Uh, men, in, men in the United States make more money than women, just in general. Like men earn more, that's not necessarily fair or right, but that's the case. So suppose that someone says, so therefore my dad makes more money than my mom. That's not necessarily true. Just because like statistically overall, men, the category, have more earning than women, doesn't mean that each individual man is a higher earner than each individual woman is. In the same way, I could say women are shorter than men, just by average, and that's true. But that doesn't mean that like one woman, like I don't know, uh, who's a tall woman, um, like Venus Williams or something, it doesn't mean that one woman randomly selected is also shorter than the average man. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's go on then. We're talking next about fallacies of relevance. That's the second category of fallacies. So those are fallacies where the problem is that um, the uh, some of the premises are not relevant to the conclusion. And that's what makes the argument weak. Um, so ad hominem is the first one there. Ad hominem fallacy is also called by another name. Anybody know about that? What is the what is the ad hominem and what is its definition? <clears throat> ad hominem. What do you think? The ad hominem fallacy, what do you say? Okay, so personal attack. Attack the person instead of the argument of the premises, right? 
So instead of giving a logical counter argument to somebody's position or point, you get into the personal attack and you, you do something that's like personally insulting. You, you say something to them that just uh, insults or attacks them directly, but you don't address their argument. Like if somebody said to you, um, my view based on the evidence is that um, there was no such thing as voter fraud in the 2020 election. Um, you know, if you really look at the local officials, they operated according to the law and courts haven't been able to find otherwise. So there has not been fraud. And the person says, you know what, you're wrong because just standing five feet away from you, I can smell your breath from here. You have disgusting breath. So obviously you don't know anything about how this election was run. You're wrong. That's not a good response because that's not at all re referring to their claim or their evidence. It's making a personal attack. And whether the person has good or bad breath or whether they're dressed nice or not, or, you know, whether they, um, you know, whether they got in trouble in high school, you bring something up about their past. And aren't you the guy that like got caught with a misdemeanor driving with no license? How do you know what you're talking about? None of that stuff would be relevant though. That's, that's personal. It's not about the argument. So when people are exchanging views on a logical argument, they're supposed to focus on the argument, not each other. It doesn't matter who the person is, what their identity is, or what facts you know about them. You're supposed to, if you don't like their argument, challenge their evidence or tell them that their evidence does not imply the conclusion. But once you start making fun of the person, insulting them, you know, attacking them, you've pretty much lost the argument there because it shows that you don't even have the ability to make a rational response. Um, and if you really thought your argument was better, you should be able to defend it with, with reason instead of personal hostility, insults. Okay, <clears throat> so let's go on to the appeal to force fallacy. Appeal to force, sometimes they call it the scare tactic. Um, I think the name of it is almost like self-explanatory. This is the one where instead of trying to um, give a person a rational argument, you just try to get them to change their mind or accept your view by uh, threatening to either use force or intimidation against them. So it's when you try to get someone to back off their position or to accept yours by making a threat or using or uh, implying the use of force of some kind. So like you're basically trying to scare someone or make them afraid so that they're not gonna say or believe what they did say. Like <clears throat> the employer says to their employee, um, some, of, some of the guys at the, um, at the office have been telling me that, you know, you believe um, uh, in, in wearing masks, um, or I don't know, this is probably not the best example because it could be a workplace policy issue. So maybe the person says, oh, um, I heard that you believe in affirmative action, um, but you know, I really don't agree with that. And let me just tell you, if you wanna work here, you better not think or, or say that. Now, is this person making a rational argument against affirmative action? No, they're just threatening you with terminating your job if you hold that view. So that's not really giving you a reason why it's good or bad. It's just saying, hey, watch out. Don't say it or believe it otherwise or else. So appeal to force is kind of like, do believe what I believe or else. And, and the or else can be filled in in many different ways. Maybe it's your parents saying, if you disagree with me politically on this issue or whatever, maybe I'm not going to pay your tuition. Or... Um, you know, maybe a person says, uh, like, if you refuse to accept my um, claim, then I'll actually make a physical attack on you. I mean, that would be like a very literal example of appeal to force. But sometimes it could be the withdrawal of favors or affection. Sometimes it could be loss of opportunity or employment or whatever. Sometimes people who have power over others can use that as leverage to make the appeal to force type of fallacy, but it's not rational, so we should try not to do that. And then when people do it, you can always call them out and say, you know, you're not even making a good argument, you're just trying to threaten. Okay, then it's next, appeal to pity. <clears throat> appeal to pity. When you try to um, make an emotional appeal to the person's feeling of sympathy in order to receive special treatment, um, but it's not relevant to the circumstance. So easy examples of this are when there's like a lame excuse for something, um, and you're trying to make the person feel sorry for you in order to give you, a, a, like, grant you an exception. So I don't know, like the, the student says to the professor, give me an extension because <clears throat> my friend just went through like a breakup and they've been dealing with a, a terrible emotional situation and I've had to help them a lot. So don't feel sorry for me and therefore you can give me an extension. Um, it's a pretty, you know, illegitimate reason to ask for one. 
the, the request for pity is not warranted based on the nature of the situation. Maybe it's the classic case of the request not to be ticketed by the officer and you say like, don't give me a ticket, I just, um, I just lost my job or something. You know, Maybe that's sad, but it doesn't mean that the person is allowed to drive at that speed. So anyway, um, appeal to pity. Popular appeal, that's next. Um, that's when you appeal to popular opinion to support your claim. Um, <clears throat> but the thing is, just because something's popular doesn't mean that it's really right or correct. You need a better argument to support whether something's good or correct than just saying it's popular. Um, like if a person says, I don't know, um, uh, Nike's better than Adidas because they sell more. Um, you know, this movie's better than another movie because it got more money at the box office. Um, it seems like, <clears throat> you know, so you can make this case with fashion, with film, with music, uh, and even with political debate. If you go back into the, like, uh, 1800s and stuff, you could say, well, most people believe women shouldn't be allowed to vote, so I think that's true. Uh, but whether it's popular or not can't possibly settle the question whether it's good and correct. If it's if it's good, then you should be able to make the argument why it's good independently of its popularity. After all, things that are popular and that deserve popularity are popular because they're good. They're not good because they're popular. Um, celebrity endorsement on products, that's also a good example, Eduardo. So sometimes we use the popularity of a person, uh, like a celebrity or athlete or whoever, and they become the endorsement sponsor for an, uh, a product or service. Um, oftentimes, it's just their popularity that's leading you to think this is a good thing to buy, um, and that's not a good enough reason. You have to make the case for something on its own grounds. Okay, so um, appeal to ignorance. Does anyone know what that one is, the appeal to ignorance fallacy? What could that one be? Appealing to ignorance. <clears throat> what kind of... Uh, it's, what are we talking about here? Appeal to ignorance. Just checking in with you, see if you could tell me about that one. <clears throat> okay, the argument states something is... Uh, well, actually, Eduardo, you have one additional negation there that has to be removed. You say the argument states something is not true because it has not been proven false. Rather, the, the, the way it's worded is that someone argues that something is true only because it has not been proven false. Does that make sense to you? Like someone says, oh, this is true because you can't prove it that it's false. Um, the way you write it, it's, it's not logical because if someone says it's not true because it hasn't been proven false, um, those two things are the same, so there's no contrast. So, okay, like Bianca, one example, you could say, oh, aliens exist, and here's my proof of it, because uh, you can't prove that they don't exist, so they must exist. But that's not real evidence of the existence of aliens. To have evidence of anything, you need to have, oh, not to worry, I just wanted to clarify. To, to have evidence for anything, you need supporting evidence. You need actually confirming evidence or facts. You can't just say no one can prove otherwise, so this must be true. A, con a current example that I think of a little bit is this whole nonsense argument about voter fraud. So, like, these cases have all been thrown out of court because every single judge looking at it says, well, you don't actually have evidence of any person who committed fraud. What you're saying is you cannot prove that nobody did not commit fraud, uh, and therefore we, we, we speculate that it must have been impossible to happen. Um, but just saying that the conditions made it such that fraud was possible and you can't prove it didn't happen it's not the same thing as actually providing substantial evidence that it did happen, okay? Um, if I could prove things just by saying there's no contrary evidence, then I could prove almost anything that I want uh, that's just a matter of pure speculation. I could say there's aliens, there's Bigfoot, there's leprechauns, because no one can prove to me that they don't exist. But you can't prove a negative, um, or at least it's very hard to do that. So in general, you need real evidence that supports a claim, not just no available counter evidence. Okay, so let's go on. Um, like, what if somebody said, hey, you know, I, think, I, I know you're cheating because you can't prove that you're not. Well, how would you respond to that? You'd have to say that's a fallacy. I mean, 
you're asking me to prove that I'm not cheating and like uh, what do I have to do like uh, give you timestamps and recording videos and stuff to have real evidence you'd have to have evidence that they are cheating like oh I can see you know you've got like lipstick on your like collar and stuff or I could see that uh, you know you need real facts and evidence you can't say I I suppose it's happening because you can't show me the, uh, the contrary okay so let's go on <clears throat> I mean, like another kid, that's in a relationship. If it was in school, it would be even worse. But the professor comes at you and says, I think you plagiarized this assignment, and I don't really know why, but I'm going to have you prove to me that you didn't. You'd be really at a loss because it's almost impossible to prove something didn't happen. Um, therefore, that would be an invalid argument. Okay, so continuing to hasty generalization. What is that? That's so, um, that is any case where you make a universal claim based on a sample that's either too small or that is biased. Um, suppose that you have like some friends and you guys have like a really kind of just specific set of interests um, that are not necessarily widespread interests of everybody. So I don't know, like you say me and my friends in my group, we love anime. And so every college student really loves anime. Maybe your friend group though is not reflective of the whole uh, body of college students because it's a self-selected sample and therefore it's going to be more inclined towards your interests. Um, so sometimes people generalize off of not enough evidence or cases. Like if somebody said, um, my boyfriend, uh, he cheated on me, and then my second boyfriend later after high school, my college boyfriend, he also cheated on me. So basically men are just cheating uh, un unfaithful people overall, all of them. But that would be to generalize to the all men based on a, two cases, um, which is per perhaps not at all enough to make such a sweeping general claim. So general claims like all, they start with the word all, um, they require extraordinary clear evidence with no counterexamples. And so you can't jump to those kind of conclusions off of just a few cases, or in some cases, just a limited number or a biased sample. So let's move on with straw man. Straw man, what is this? Does anybody know straw man fallacy? <clears throat> what do you think? Someone knows it, I think, so just throw it out there. Soon we'll never have this opportunity again. So let's take the, take the chance and uh, make the most of it. Let's have a little interaction. Okay, Eduardo. Misrepresenting a person's argument to make it sound worse, make it easier to refute or argue against. That's right. Same with you, Ken. Distort an argument uh, to make it easier to argue with. Bianca, the way you put it, when one distorts an argue, opponent's argument to make it seem easier to fault. Those are all fair ways to put it, and th that's very good. So, yeah. Straw man is when you take your opponent's real argument and then you distorted and misrepresented so that it sounds worse and therefore easier for you to debunk or to push back against. Like if somebody said, um, I think that the border wall concept is a little bit uh, unnecessary in terms of how much money it will cost and also maybe the message that it sends um, to people who want to seek asylum or refuge in the United States. And then someone else says, okay, so here's what you're telling me. Just let anybody in at any time and have just no border controls. That's really, really irresponsible. So you must not know what you're talking about. But the person did not say that. They didn't say have no border controls. They just disputed one perhaps policy action to address it, which is a wall. Um, so they're misrepresenting and overhyping, oversimplifying the person's actual argument. Or a person says they believe that there should be legalization of marijuana because it's not as addictive or that it doesn't seem that it might even have certain medicinal benefits. And then their opponent says, okay, but hold on. If we legalize all the drugs, like you're saying, then people are going to just be on crack and they're not going to be able to finish school and they're not going to be able to hold down a job or keep a relationship, you know, or raise kids. That's going to lead to the whole downfall of society. So your argument is out of control. But the person didn't even say that. You know, the actual argument they gave was much more moderate and careful. And it was only about one of the uh, federally scheduled class, uh, schedule one uh, controlled substances, marijuana. Um, so it happens a lot. People sometimes want to not really attack the opponent's real argument, but like a fake, uh, exaggerated or oversimplified version of their argument. 
Um, if somebody says, oh, I don't believe we should have genetically modified um, crops, you know, GMO crops, we should go back to like organic production of fruits and vegetables. And someone says, okay, well, if you're saying stop and shut down farming, then we're all going to starve and we're not going to even have a strong economy. So that's not good. But the person didn't say stop farming. They just said maybe move to a different method of agricultural production. Anyway, just giving examples. But let's go to the next. So red herring. Red herring um, is the fallacy where you try to distract from the main topic of debate to something else. Like if somebody says um, um, opioid use in the United States is a huge problem um, and sometimes people are being overprescribed with these very addictive opioid substances. So I think that that's something that we need to curtail. And the other person says, no, we don't need to curtail that because, I mean, what you really need to look at is the social justice issues of, uh, of, of Black Lives Matter. Um, I fully support that whole movement, but what I'm pointing out is that that's not the same topic. So you couldn't really disagree with the person's initial statement about drugs and opioids by referring to a whole different um, issue in society. It would be like if somebody says global warming is a problem and someone says, no, it's not. Look at terrorism. That's a problem. They're different problems. So you're not really debunking the person's case that there's one issue by referring to something else that's totally unrelated. Red herring originally refers to a way of trying to train dogs to hunt, um, bloodhounds and stuff. They would try to make sure that they didn't get distracted from the scent of the actual animal they're trying to retrieve for the hunter by these smelly little herrings that the hunter would place to see if they would be distracted by the herrings and thrown off the course of the main target. So in like logic, conversation, and debate, uh, sometimes people want to distract you from your main course of conversation or focus, and the red herring they throw out is not literally a fish, but a distracting side tangent. Okay, so then there's a couple more. There's the fallacies of unwarranted assumption. That's the third category, and that is the category of fallacies that basically have um, assumptions that are not justified by evidence. So they contain... Um, speculation or assumption that you don't have evidence for. One of them first is begging the question. Um, so what's begging the question, anybody? Maybe you know this one. With the begging the question fallacy, what's up with that? <clears throat> Someone just let me know. Okay. Tron. Reworded version of the conclusion. What is the? It's when that's that's definitely part of the definition, yes. But there's one thing missing. Bianca, you say when one of the premises of the argument is a reworded version of the conclusion. Yes, that's right. Like if I say to you, here's my argument that abortion is wrong. That yeah, the premise. When one of the premises is reworded version of conclusion. Yes, Bianca. So if I say, here's my argument that abortion is wrong, it's wrong because it's just not right to end a pregnancy. Um, well, abortion is just synonymous, equivalent to the idea of ending a pregnancy. Um, to say something's wrong is the same as to say that it is not right. So this argument just goes in a circle. It says it's wrong. Why? Because it's wrong. But you have to give independent grounds for a conclusion. You can't just say the conclusion itself. Like if I told you... Um, Philosophy is the best subject because out of all the subjects, there's no subject that's better than it. Don't you understand? That's not really making any kind of um, case. That's just saying it's the best because it's the best. Take it from sports. The Lakers are the best team in the NBA because all other teams are inferior. Do you understand how the premise there, all other teams are inferior, it just is a reworded slightly different way of wording the statement that is the conclusion that they're the best. If they're the best, then all the other teams are not as good. And that's just the same idea stated twice. So begging the question happens when people don't really have reasons for their conclusion and they just repeat the conclusion as the reason but modify the, the way that it's worded. Um, okay. So let's go on. Inappropriate appeal to authority. This one is where you try to gain support for your claim by appealing to the view of somebody, but the person is not really an expert or an authority on that topic. Like you could say, um, 
Uh, I was getting my car fixed the other day and I was chatting with the mechanic and my mechanic was just telling me that these vaccines are, um, it's like a big government conspiracy and they're really trying to microchip you. So I better not get the vaccine for the coronavirus. What's the problem though? Who were you using as support? The opinion of the mechanic. Now with no disrespect to mechanics, they're just not qualified to maybe speak on such an issue as vaccination um, and infectious diseases. Now, if a real expert in that field says something about it, then that's okay. If you're hearing Dr. Fauci say whatever about the effectiveness or safety of the vaccine, then that's something that you can take to the bank and rely on. But you're not supposed to justify your opinion by appeal to those that are not actual expert. Um, a, a real life example of this could be like, okay, so in the coronavirus task force for a while, one of the chief advisors to Trump was this guy, Dr. Scott Atlas from Stanford. He's not a infectious disease specialist. And so he doesn't know a lot about viruses and virology, but he kept telling the president, hey, just let everybody get sick. Don't worry about social distancing and masking. Let's let herd immunity take over. But this guy's a radiologist. He's not immunology or infectious disease specialist. So all the advice he was giving was bad and unreliable, but because he had the title of doctor, you know, people would listen to him and take him seriously. It's the same kind of thing with me. I mean, I have the title doctor, I'm Dr. Vulich, but I don't know enough about certain subjects to be someone who you can rely on for facts on that topic. Like, I don't know anything about whatever, geology, what's going on with the different layers of rock underneath the Earth's surface, I have no concept of that. So if you told me that Dr. Vulich said, uh, that the third layer of earth is clay, and that's why I think it's true. I'm not the authority to talk to about that. Go to your geology professors and so on, and they'll give you the right facts. Okay, so anyway, let's go ahead to the next. Loaded question. Um, loaded question is when you ask a certain type of question, but the problem is what? The question assumes something that you don't know. Like if somebody says to you, um, I don't know, like, when did you lose your virginity? That's one. It's like, you might not have lost it, and so we can't give a date and time. It's a loaded question. Or if somebody says, um, who are you seeing right now? And you're, you're single. The question is a loaded question because it assumes you're in a relationship without knowing. Or what if someone says, where are you working at the time? And you're unemployed. Or when is the baby due? But you're not even pregnant. They're just assuming that. Um, <clears throat> you're in court, and the lawyer says, yeah, that's another one, right, Eduardo? The lawyer says, um, You've pled not guilty. The lawyer's cross-examining you, and he's like, look, here you are on the stand, and we've heard the evidence, so just tell us for the first time, why did you kill this person? Why did you do it? That's a loaded question because you're saying you didn't do it, and they're asking the question as though you did, and we just need to know your motive. Um, police officer pulls you over, and uh, you weren't even speeding, but they say, um, do you know how fast you're speeding? <laughs> And so, you know, it's like you can't really answer without conceding the point that you did it, but that's something that you're not going to say happened. Um, here's one within a relationship, and then we move on. What if you're in a relationship and the partner just turns to you and says, hey, what's wrong? How could that be a loaded question? What's being assumed? This sometimes does happen, actually. Yeah, they assume something's wrong and they just need to know what it is. But if nothing's wrong, then you got to say, it's kind of a loaded question. There's nothing wrong. Um, why do you think something's wrong? So anyway, loaded question. Um, yes, that's right. So moving to the false dilemma. False dilemma is when um, you try to oversimplify a complex issue. And so you reduce the responses to the complex issue to a binary either or choice. Like if somebody says to you, tell me, which, which party are you registered with? Is it Republican or Democrat? How's that a false dilemma? Well, it ignores the uh, possible option of being unaffiliated with either or having a third party affiliation. Me, for example, I'm neither one. I'm registered and declined to state, so I'm independent. Um, and if a person says that to me or gave me that as my two set of choices, I say, oh, it's a false dilemma. There's more possible choices. You could be Green Party. You could be... American Independent, you could be Peace and Freedom Party, there's a lot of other parties, but I'm just declined to state. There's libertarians, there's all kinds of options. Uh, another false dilemma, someone says, do you love me or do you hate me? How do you feel about me? Is it love or hate? How could that be a false dilemma? There's other possibilities, right? It doesn't have to be intense passion and love or like hatred and dis 
you know, discussed. It'd be something in the middle. Like, I'm just kind of neutral. I don't know. I'm kind of mad. I don't really have strong feelings. Um, it's not that I hate or love the person. Um, or somebody says, um, I don't know. What do you think? Should we have a big expensive wall or just let anybody in at any time? That's also a false dilemma because clearly there's a middle ground in between the two. Um, let's see. What if someone said... Uh, Trying to think of another good example. If you have any, then you can throw them out there too. Um, it could have to do with just binary options where there's just a, a, a variety of possibilities in between. Love America or hate it, right? That's another possibility. If you want to love it or leave it, um, no, I want to stay there and also still be critical because criticism is what makes things improve. Um, so it's fair to neither have unconditional love nor to say I hate it so much and I just don't even want to be there. There could be redeeming qualities in something that's not perfect, right? Even in you know our founding documents, our founding fathers said that we're trying to create a more perfect union. And that's supposed to be a mission that we keep going forward with. Certainly, it wasn't perfect in the beginning when we had slavery and women not being able to vote. So we just keep trying to improve. Okay, um, <clears throat> going on, questionable cause. That's when a person makes the unjustified assumption that something is the cause of something else without good evidence. A lot of times it's just because one thing happened first and the other thing happened later and some person thinks that's enough for me to claim that that's the cause, but it's not. Um, you wake up and you, you're you using like a little pocket mirror and you accidentally drop it and it breaks. And then later on that day, um, your mom calls you and she's like, I need you to help me because I got into a small car accident and my car has been totaled, so this is not good. And you're like, man, I knew that when I broke that mirror, there would be bad luck. So it caused her to get into an accident. But obviously, the real cause of the accident has nothing to do with a mirror dropping and breaking in some completely other different part of space and time. It has everything to do with the conditions on the road and uh, what the motorist's decisions were and the other physical factors on the roadways. So sometimes superstitious beliefs can enter into our thought and that's usually the case of a questionable cause. You um, you do like a secret little good luck, um, I don't know, a recitation of a good luck charm. You say like a little phrase that you think is lucky and then you win um, at Vegas gambling. And you say, I knew that's the reason that I won because I said the good luck charm first. <laughs> Sorry, I got hit up all of a sudden. Let me get this water going. Snap your fingers, you set a good luck charm, then you won the, uh, the jackpot doing slots. It's not the reason that you won, though, because if it really was able to induce that as a reliable cause and effect, then people would figure this out and you could just game the system. Keep saying the, the phrase over and over and just systematically keep winning. Okay, so cause and effect, you need detailed evidence to associate the two events as having that causal relationship. Without that, you're pretty much going to commit this fallacy. Next, slippery slope. Um, slippery slope is when you assume without good reason that if one action is either taken or allowed, that that's going to lead to further and further actions and eventually all actions of that type will either be taken or allowed. And usually it's described as like a, a warning not to go in that direction at all, even a little bit. Because if you do, it'll compound and become worse and worse as you slide down this metaphoric slippery slope. So like, don't try that one little sip of alcohol. You're thinking of experimenting and just seeing how it feels, but it starts off with that one little drink, and then that's putting you on a slippery slope to total alcoholism, drug addiction, and no ability to be a responsible, productive human being. Uh, but obviously that's not necessarily true. Many people can drink in moderation or whatever, um, and therefore this is perhaps an, a, a slippery slope fallacy. Someone says, don't allow your kid to um, you know, get you to give in and give them a candy bar when they're begging for it at the grocery store. Because if you give in to their desires and wants here, then they're going to become spoiled, and then throughout their whole life, they'll end up being someone that cheats, that can't follow through, that um, eventually become criminal, criminal because they can't wait for the things that they want, and they feel like they have to steal to get them. So don't give them the candy bar. That big 
prediction of like a negative sequence of events following from the one action is just a slippery slope. Um, sometimes we hear about it in the case of like policy and society. Like somebody said, um, don't allow gays to marry because it puts us on a slippery slope to less and less traditional definitions of marriage. And down the line, maybe people will be allowed to marry, I don't know, themselves or um, just inanimate objects like their microwave or something. Well, that would be insane and crazy. So we don't want to do that. So don't even allow the one alteration to the traditional idea of uh, marriage between heterosexual partners. Obviously, none of those things have materialized. So that's another case. Or people said the same thing with like... Um, um, I don't know, like allowing transgender bathrooms, eventually that's going to cause people of all different stripes to be in every bathroom and there'll be no more privacy. Or someone could have argued um, legalizing marijuana is a slippery slope to the full-blown legalization of all the drugs. Um, so whatever the case is, there's a lot of different slippery slopes. I've heard it about artificial intelligence. Don't allow us to develop um, strong AI because it's putting us on a slippery slope towards world domination by, by uh, sentient computers in the future. Okay, just giving examples. So then the last one here is the naturalistic fallacy. Naturalistic fallacy is when a person just um, assumes that what kind of things are good, or on the other hand, that what kind of things are bad. Can you tell me that? What's the assumption around the naturalistic fallacy? It, it's all based on the assumption that what kind of stuff is good? Let me know. <clears throat> what do you think? Naturalistic. Just, it's not too bad. It's something I think you can quickly throw out at, at me. Anything that's, okay, natural is good. Anything unnatural is bad. Correct. That's not always true, though. Like right now, you're doing something unnatural. In this very moment, you're watching this lecture through your computer, and these computers don't grow on trees, and, you know, the broadband and internet telecommunications and other systems that we've invented, the technology that we have, these things are man-made. They don't come out of nature. They come from innovation. So if you really think everything natural is bad, then you should get rid of this computer right now, throw out your television, get rid of your refrigerator, microwave, all the different medicines, et cetera, that are the byproduct of human industry because we don't find those things in nature. But obviously the point is many of those things are good and they've made our lives better and they streamline uh, and add a lot of value to our lives. So is it really true that everything natural, uh, unnatural is bad? No, not really, because we have transportation, planes, trains, automobiles, um, mobile phone, broadband, mobile GPS satellites, a lot of medicines and so on. We have plumbing, we have running water. Um, I could go on and on, right? None of these things are found just itself in nature. And then on the other hand, there are many natural things that are not good for you. So do you really want a hurricane? Do you really want an earthquake? Maybe, um, you know, to get some kind of infectious disease? I mean, those come from nature, right? The coronavirus, that's, that's nature right there. That's not like a man-made pathogen. So sometimes natural things are good, of course, but it's not 100%. So you got to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. If you just say, hey, look, they're telling me I need chemotherapy to treat cancer, but that's not natural, so it's bad. On the other hand, there's these herbal supplements and stuff that just come from plants, and that is natural, so I think it's good. That person's not going to take the most effective course of treatment, and they might end up being worse off in terms of their health because they refuse something that they claim to be bad since it's not natural. Same with vaccines, right? You're going to have these people, and we're going to hear a lot about it in the next year. The anti-vaccine people, they'll be saying stuff like that. You know, hey, these vaccines are man-made, man -made, they're made in the lab, they don't grow on trees, so they can't be good, I refuse to take them. Meanwhile, they're going to get sick and die. So, you know, um, you can't just blanket assume everything natural is good, everything unnatural is bad. I mean, drugs and stuff are natural, too. You're going to do cocaine or whatever because it just grows from the coca leaf, uh, and you're gonna, not going to be so healthy in that case either. Okay, so <clears throat> we've done with the Chapter 5 review. Now I'm looking at the stuff here in chapter 10 and 11. Um, I only had a couple questions about that because I spent most of the time on media just having you guys do your fallacy assignment. Um, but there are a couple points. Media literacy, the ability to understand um, the influence of mass media on you. So being able to understand and interpret the influence of mass media. Product placement. Product placement is when the product is placed in the programming itself instead of during breaks or during intermissions. It would be like if you're watching like a movie and 
character like busts out a MacBook and starts working on an Apple computer. That that product is only placed in the movie because there's a licensing agreement between Apple and the producers of the film. Um, basically, that's a covert ad that's placed in the movie, and it's impossible for you to avoid the ad because it's in the film itself that you're watching. So, you know, if you don't like commercials and sponsored ads, sometimes you can click past them. Sometimes you can mute them. If it was TV, you could change the channel. If it was your web browser and it was really long, I guess you could open another window. But um, you can't avoid advertisement when it's in the programming that you want to watch itself. Other examples could be like in sports where you see, I don't know, in football products and uh, sponsored stuff that's put on the walls of the stadium or like in NASCAR racing, the cars have all these decals embossed on them that are sponsorship and you're watching the race. So it's an advertisement happening during the race. Okay. It's an effective way to advertise because you can't escape it. But for those of us that don't like ads that much, it's a little annoying. Anyway, next up, three main purposes of ads. One, to um, just create product awareness. Two, to inform the consumer about the product or service. So like telling you what it actually does or what it's good for. And then third would be to stimulate customer or consumer demand. So in some cases, the advertisement doesn't even tell you anything about the product, like why you would want it. It just says like Coca-Cola. So you just remember that it exists. That's product awareness. Sometimes they're trying to tell you why you want the good or service, what information about the product. So it's like a car commercial. They might say, hey, it's four-wheel drive, and it's got this kind of safety record, and um, whatever. They might say that kind of stuff. Uh, so you know about why you would want it. And then the third is to stimulate consumer demand. Sometimes that's done by uh, giving a popular endorsement sponsor towards the ad, and that makes people think it's cool because they associate it with that person, like I don't know, Matthew McConaughey. Uh, doing ads for like Lincoln cars. Um, part of the ad is it's talking about the car. Part of it is just that it's using this guy to make it seem more cool, and that's um, stimulating demand. And then another part is just to remind you of the logo and the symbol of Lincoln. So some of these purposes can be all achieved in a single ad, and sometimes one or other of those purposes will be the emphasis of it. Okay, so then it's about science, chapter 12, and we have a whole bunch of different questions on science. Um, Maybe I'll jump around a little bit so that we can get to the most information possible. First of all, here, um, what is science? Science is reasoning from observable facts to testable explanations for the facts. So with science, we start off just looking at the world, observing it, collecting data, and seeing what things are happening. And then we try to provide explanations for why they're happening. And we try to give explanations in science that can be tested so that you don't have to just take a person's word for it, but you have ability to experimentally verify it. Um, in science, there are certain kind of assumptions that are built into it. One of them is the assumption of unity. That's the idea that the universe overall is unified, and therefore there should be one set of natural laws that could describe everything. So the belief that the universe is integrated and unified, and there should be one set of natural laws that could explain all things. There are certain limitations of science. That's a question that's in the, the study guide. One limitation is that it can only study the things that are observable. So if there's something unobservable, like, I don't know, think right now of a memory of your childhood. I can't see it, and nobody else can see it, so it's not, like, visually uh, visible or, or auditory, like, hearable, but it's something that exists, your thoughts. So science might have a harder time understanding the nature of thought because it's unobservable, or, like, dark matter or stuff of that kind. Another limitation is that it assumes the existence of the external world, which we can't absolutely prove since if there were a simulation going on right now and the world was not real, then you would not be able to tell the difference between the simulation and the reality. Another limitation is um, predictability. Some people say, how can you really know that the natural laws will never change since we don't know what's going to happen in the future exactly? We can only base it on predictions from what we've seen in the past. So that's perhaps another limitation, the assumption of predictability. Now, the scientific method um, involves five steps, pretty much. But the basic big three are you observe a unexplained phenomenon. Then you try to give a hypothesis why it happened. And then you try to give a test that can evaluate whether the hypothesis is true or false. In the end, if you get confirmation for your hypothesis, then it looks like you're giving the correct explanation for the phenomena that was originally unexplained. Um, 
let's see, what's the three level model of critical thinking? How is it similar to the scientific method? The basic similarities are in the three stages of, okay, in critical thinking, you have experience, interpretation, and analysis. In science, you have observation, hypothesis, and test. And those are three stages that are very similar to each other because observation slash experience, both of them are just saying what is happening without yet knowing why. Interpretation slash hypothesis is where you're going and trying to give your reasoning why you think it is happening, you're trying to give the explanation why that event happened. And then experiment slash um, analysis is when you now try to consider whether your explanation or uh, hypothesis is correct. So that's where you check the hypothesis or you check the uh, interpretation. Okay, so first step in the scientific method, identify a problem, some unexplained phenomena, something that you need to try and give an explanation for. Uh, second step, develop an initial hypothesis. Let me understand, what is a hypothesis? Anybody know that? <clears throat> what do you think is a hypothesis? So, okay, it's an educated guess. It's an educated scientific guess to explain uh, the occurrence of the observed phenomena at step one. So it's a guess, but it's a guess about what? It's a guess about how did that thing happen? Why did it happen? Yeah. What's the difference between a theory and a hypothesis? Theories, um, and Eduardo, I see your comment, proposed explanation to understand a particular phenomenon. That's also a good way to put it, correct. Um, what's a theory versus a hypothesis? Theories start off as hypothesis. What causes a hypothesis to transform and become a theory? What has to happen for it to get to that status? What do you think on that? started as a hypothesis, it ended up being a theory. How would that go down? No, nothing on that one? Well, I'll, I'll hold for a minute, see if you get the uh, thought. But I have something to say about this if you can't. Well, here's the idea. Um, but I don't want to cut you off. If you have something to say, please do type it in. Not, irrespective of the fact that I'm going to say something here. So um, a theory is just a very, okay. Yeah, there you go. Very good, Ken. So a theory is just a very well-proven hypothesis. Um, hypotheses originally are tentative and they're subject to revision or uh, to be eliminated in favor of a different explanation. But once you have a hypothesis that's been verified by your test and then other people replicate and reconfirm it, and by the time it gets confirmed and established by a bunch of different people in different independent conditions, we think that it's now got the status of theory. So theory is just a very well-tested and well-proven hypothesis. Science never claims absolute certainty, but the closest we can get is to say we have a, a very good theory, and this theory seems to be true. So what began as a hypothesis has graduated to become a theory through the, through the um, ability that it has to be verified by test many times. Okay. Now, Bianca, you're mentioning something, but that's actually in reference, that's important, but it's in reference to how you evaluate the hypothesis after the test. Correct. So when you finish the whole scientific method and you did your testing on the hypothesis, you have to look and see at the end, did my hypothesis get confirmed by this experiment or did it get disconfirmed? If it is confirmed, then you do publish the results to the remainder of the scientific community and then they try to replicate it and hopefully now it's on the road to being theory. But if the test did not verify or confirm the hypothesis, then that's not your hypothesis that is the right one. So you gotta go back to the drawing board pretty much and go and create another hypothesis and run through the steps again until eventually you get your experimental verification or confirmation. Okay. Um, so an initial hypothesis, testing the hypothesis, that's creating an experiment either in a lab or in the real world, which will be able to determine if the hypothesis is true or false. Um, so good hypotheses should be relevant to the problem being studied. That means they should be at least on the same topic as the subject being studied. Um, a good hypothesis should also be able to make accurate predictions. So good hypotheses or theories can be used to make accurate predictions of future events. That's what's called predictive power. Um, here's a question, who's Copernicus? A person named Nicholas Copernicus is an important um, 
historic figure in, in the history of Western science, but who was he and what did he do, if anyone knows that? <clears throat> Nicholas Copernicus, he had a very big discovery of something. Okay, so yeah, he was the Polish astronomer who discovered heliocentrism, which did replace geocentrism, correct. Let me ask you though, or anybody else, if I could get one more detail, what is heliocentrism and what is geocentrism that it replaced? Because that, we know the words, but we have to make sure that we are clear on what they mean. So what are those two things? What was his discovery in more detail? Hmm. We see, yeah, you, you've got heliocentrism and geocentrism. I'm just asking for the definition of those two things because someone might just memorize the words and not know what they're actually writing, what it means. So I just need to get that clear one time. Are you guys stumped on this? You got, I mean, if you, if you wrote the definition, Okay, so here you go, heliocentrism, planets revolve around the sun. Geocentrism, planets revolve around the earth, yeah. So he proved using new telescopes that were invented during his time that, that we revolve around the sun, not the other way around. It was believed before him for a long time in the West that the earth was at the center of everything and that it was not moving. It was just standing still while everything rotated around us. Part of the reason they believed that is because they thought God would have wanted it to be that humans and the earth the children of God are at the center, the centerpiece of all creation. Um, but it's not true, and he discovered otherwise. That really opened the door for the scientific revolution because it starts to show that the church doesn't know everything, and through empirical investigation, we might discover things that go contrary to like the orthodox views of religion. Okay, materialism within science. What's the idea of materialism? Anybody know this one? It's a viewpoint in science. Just asking if you know what that idea is. <clears throat> it says everything's made out of a certain kind of thing, but uh, maybe you can help finish my thought there. Everything's made out of what? <clears throat> Everything in the universe is made out of physical matter, correct. Even, okay, important little extra, even this, even what? Everything in the universe is made of physical matter? Okay, good. Even uh, us and our consciousness. So like you and your thoughts, feelings, hopes, dreams, fears, pleasure, pain, you know, all the thoughts and experiences that you have mentally. According to materialism, that's just brain waves that are physical consequences of your physical brain and everything's physical. So there's no such thing then as the supernatural or the soul or like ghosts. That's materialism. Everything's made out of atoms. Everything's physical. Okay, um, there's one item on the list about views between science and religion, like what are different attitudes of the relationship of them. Some people think that science should be the one that you prioritize if we have a disagreement between science and religion. So if you favor science over religion, then if you were asked, what do you believe, evolution or creationism, you would say evolution. Another attitude is the opposite, favoring religion over science when they do not agree. So that would be a person who says, no, evolution is false, and I agree with creationism. That's the religious view, and I reject the scientific view. Another possibility would be to say, no, that they, uh, they're in separate lanes, that they deal with different topics. Science is about the physical, and uh, religion is about the spiritual and the moral. Um, and a fourth attitude is that actually they do agree in the end. They, they don't sometimes look like they agree, but if you simply interpret religion in the right way, you'll find that it doesn't say something different from science so that they're compatible. That's a fourth possible view. Um, a good scientific theory should be consistent with other established theories. So it should not contradict them, it should fit in. All these different scientific theories are supposed to kind of build into one big picture like a puzzle piece uh, or like puzzle pieces that form like a larger image. So if you got one uh, theory and it doesn't fit in and if it was true, we would have to take other pieces out to make space for it, then that's not the, the best theory. We usually think that, in with only very rare exceptions, that um, we have to fit into the existing body of knowledge. Um, falsifiability. 
it is a good thing when a theory is capable of being proven false. So falsifiability is when a theory is able to somehow be proven false. That does not mean that it is false or that it will be proven false, but that there's a way of testing for falsehood. If you don't know how to check for whether it's false, then you also cannot test whether it's true. To do a test for a theory, you need to know what result would show that the theory was incorrect, and on the other hand, what result of the experiment would show that it is correct. But if you don't know how it could possibly be shown to be false, then there's no way you can design a test of that kind. Um, like Einstein said that if my theory of relativity is correct, then you should see certain visual phenomena when we have a solar eclipse. If that doesn't happen, then my theory might be wrong. Um, so at least we knew what to look for when the eclipse happened to determine whether his theory would end up being correct or not. If it's not falsifiable, it's not scientific because it's not testable. And stuff like astrology and palm reading and stuff is not falsifiable because they don't say, look, here's what it has to be for our astrology stuff to be incorrect. They don't even give you a chance to prove that it's false. Okay, Occam's razor slash simplicity, another quality of a good scientific theory. Um, so if you have two or more explanations for the same phenomenon, the simpler of the two is the likelier one to be true. That's what science assumes, that the simpler explanation is probably more likely to be the one that is correct. Because I guess the belief is that the universe is more or less elegant and simple and uh, tends to align with the simpler of two explanations. Okay. Um, assumption of predictability, I think we talked about that. The assumption of objectivity, that's the assumption that, um, <clears throat> oh no, actually predictability we do have to talk about. So predictability, that the universe is orderly and predictable, and so when we've established cause and effect relationships, that they will hold forever, and that they'll be repeatable forever. So because of the effect of gravity, we know already that when I drop this marker, it will fall to the table. And the assumption of predictability is that that's not just going to happen once, but that it would happen twice, three times. And if I had enough time, I could do it forever, and it would keep on happening that way because we think these laws will never change. There will never be a day when gravity stops working, or there will never be a day when the principles of physics, like thermodynamics and stuff, that they don't function. So we believe these are laws of nature, but not just today and now but for all time and for every, everywhere throughout space and time. Um, objectivity is the assumption of science that we human beings can actually learn about the world as it really is, that we can learn about the universe and the world as it really is factually, and that we can get to the truth without any bias clouding our judgment. What's pseudoscience? Anyone know that? Can you tell me about pseudoscience, somebody, just anything? Hmm. Pseudoscience, what could that be? Let's see where you're at with this one item. Es explanations that masks under science, sort of. Uh, but I think the precise wording, that's good, but I think the precise wording was like um, a body of explanations that, that masquerades as science. So a field of explanations that wants to seem as though it's scientific, but it's not actually. And so it's fake science. It's something that tries to like give off the appearance of being somehow based on scientific principles, but it's not really. And yeah, one example could be astrology, Palm reading, crystal ball, gazing, tarot cards, um, and on and on. I think we can understand the kind of genre that pseudoscience falls within. There's no tests for those claims in those fields. Their language uh, is vague, so it could almost support any prediction. A lot of problems there. Sir Francis Bacon. This was a British philosopher and statesman uh, in the... 15 and 1600s who discovered and it created really the steps of the scientific method. So we owe him a big gratitude debt because the scientific method is fundamental to the prog to the process of doing scientific research. Um, empiricism, that's the last piece of terminology from our chapter 12 notes. Empiricism is the belief that most of our human knowledge comes from the five senses and from observation. Um, so the things that you can see, taste, touch, hear, and smell, either directly or indirectly, 
is the basis for most of our knowledge. Now, the last piece of review for the final is the stuff from chapter nine, and that's the stuff that we've most recently covered. So it's probably a little bit more fresh in your mind as compared with some of the older material, but it's all about ethics. It's all about ethics and morality. So what is ethics, the study of morality and moral concepts, stuff like in the realm of right and wrong and good and bad, and just and unjust. Moral reasoning, when you make a judgment, when you make a decision about what's right or wrong or what you should or shouldn't do, that's when you're morally reasoning. Like, should I take this performance enhancing drug even if it's against the rules? Should I submit this plagiarized paper even though it's a fundamental violation of the norms and standards of the school? Um, should I cheat on my partner even though I know that that's something that's not, um, that, that I promised not to do when we got married, you know? So more reasoning sometimes kicks in when you're wondering whether you should do something or shouldn't do it. Sometimes it's when you judge other people's actions and behavior. Like what they did was wrong and that's my belief or whatever. What they did was good and deserves praise. Um, three types of moral action. There's morally impermissible, morally permissible, and morally obligatory. Impermissible means it's wrong, it's not okay to do morally. Permissible means it is okay to do and it's not wrong. Obligatory means that you must do it and it would be wrong not to. And you can think of examples of those like we talked about in class. There are moral values and non-moral values. Moral values, values that are good for you and other people, um, but they're also considered good in their own, for their own sake, like compassion, forgiveness, justice. Having those values leads you to do things that are good for people, but also it makes you feel good. And even if it doesn't work out, we still think it's a good thing in and of itself just to have those values. Non-moral values are values that are more goal-oriented and they're desired as a means to the end of your personal happiness or whatever. And that's like fame and popularity, wealth, prestige. They're important too, but you should not have um, a total disconnect from the moral values because there's information and evidence to suggest that they make your life better and happier even though they're a little bit more altruistic. Um, there are different types of moral sentiments like <clears throat> helper's high, good feeling you get when you help people. Um, there's, there's guilt. That's when you feel bad because you committed a wrong and you want to correct a wrong. There's shame. That's a bad feeling that you get from violating a social norm, and that's a little different from guilt because you can breach a social norm without doing anything immoral. Um, conscience internal source of knowledge about what's right and wrong that we're kind of born with, but we can either allow it to develop and grow or to become weak. Um, let's see. There's three stages of moral development. That's something that we all talk about, like pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. Remember those. Those were discussed by, um, what was the guy's name? Not William Perry Jr., but Lawrence Colburn. And uh, he said that we have... The pre-conventional stage where you just think morality is all about avoiding punishment. It's a little more self-centered. Conventional stage, it's all about fitting in to what's normal and approved of socially so that you can get uh, judged as a good person in society. And then the third level is post-conventional where you say, I'm going to think about this stuff on my own, using my own moral judgment and my best moral principles. Um, yeah, you know what, Felipe? I actually, that is a typo. Uh, it's supposed to be moral outrage. And so if you're looking at that list, that would be the term I would have preferred to write. So that's why I didn't go over it just now. But since you're calling it out, moral outrage, that's when you witness or observe something unjust and then you become upset because of that. Um, like, you know, you see, a, a, I don't know, vigilante justice against like a marginalized person. And, you know, you become really mad about that or like a police misconduct or or whatever the case would have been. Um, let's see. Then there's the different types of um, moral theory. And that's kind of like the last part of notes from chapter nine. So some theories are relativistic, that morality is not universal, it's subjective. Other people have universal thinking about morality, that it is objective. To the relativists, there's ethical subjectivism and cultural relativism. And I leave it to you to kind of determine what the difference between the two is, where they think morality comes from. But both of them are somewhat subject to criticism because they can't say that there's anything that's really a fact about morality. So if you felt like it's wrong, no matter who does it, for people to like commit certain actions, then you'd have to reach more towards the uh, universalist theories. And inside of universalism, there's both utilitarian ethics and Kantian ethics. So utilitarianism, create the most happiness, uh, 
for the greatest number of people, and that's what's right. Some of the founders of that were Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, who we talked about a little bit, and they're in the book. And um, Kant is the major figure behind Kantianism and deontology. Deontology is the ethics that says you have to do your moral duty no matter what. And um, it doesn't matter what the consequences are or if it even makes people happy. The categorical imperative is his principle that he uses to determine what's right and wrong. It says only do things that could be okay if everybody did it. So only act in a way that could be a universal law. And then there was at the very end some discussion of rights. There's liberty rights, rights to be left alone to do things that you have a freedom to do. And then welfare rights, which are rights to be provided certain essential goods or services if you can't get them for yourself. The last thing is virtue and what are virtues? Virtues are like positive character traits um, that are the subject of praise, like being generous, kind, compassionate, brave. <clears throat> And some people think those are the things that we should try to embody in our lives to live our best lives and to be good people. So anyway, um, you know, I, I tried my best to give a good uh, review of all the topics or most of the topics that are on the second study guide. So now that we're done with that, um, the only thing left is for us to take our final. So I'm going to definitely send the final later today during our regular kind of class period. Um, and so you'll get it no later than four and you'll have until 5.30 to send back all your answers to me. And then after that, you know, I'm just grading that and the last homework that you submitted, I'll be done with the grades, certainly no later than the 17th because that's the deadline, but I'm gonna make sure to get done a little earlier. So um, through the weekend or maybe Monday or Tuesday, everything should be ready. And then anyone can ask me uh, about any scores or their total grade um, through email and I'll send an announcement to the class for that. But I guess now we're ready to go. Um, you're going to get the, the final. You're going to receive it through, um, through Canvas um, as a class-wide announcement, and it'll be attached. And then you just have to send me back your answers. Um, when I get your test back, I'll give you confirmation. But here's the thing. You're going to have to hold for my confirmation until, uh, yes, Nicole, uh, I will. I will right after this meeting. I'm going to go through my email inbox and, and check on all of them. Anybody who needed anything in terms of scheduling or anything else, don't worry. You're not going to miss your final, and I'm, I'm going to be flexible enough to make sure that everybody takes it, even those that need a slight adjustment of time. Um, the only thing I'll ask is that those people still uh, adhere to some kind of 90-minute window, but we'll work it out, so there's nothing to worry about. I'll, I'll be right with you on the email. Okay, guys, so for now, anyways, have a good day. Um, be ready for the test at 4. I do have office hours from 2.30 to 3.30, and I'm going to send a link for that as well after this. So anybody who had any last-minute questions or concerns could drop in if they need it. But I guess for now, have a good one. It's been good working with you guys all semester. Um, I'm sure, you know, as time goes on, we'll, we'll cross paths again. But, um, but yeah, it's been a good class, and uh, we've, we've made the best of it, I think, uh, as, as good as it can be, you know, under the conditions that we're working in. But I uh, appreciate you guys, and uh, I'm happy that I could have helped teach you a little bit. Uh, in life. So I'll see you guys next time around maybe and uh, until then happy new year and good luck on the final. Okay, see you soon. Bye-bye.